Hey, what's up, family? Hey, uh, let's get disturbed together. Check out this paper. Casualty Care Implications of Large-Scale Combat Operations. This was published uh, 31 May in Journal of Trauma and Acute Surgery by Rimandelli, Rimmick, Shackelford, Gurney, Pamplin, Polk, Potter, and Holt. Uh, these are all big names in the community. And the thing that I want to point out is one, large-scale combat operations are super intense, and holy cow, are we all grappling with what that looks like now that we're all kind of concerned that we're moving into a Cold War mindset. But the bottom line is that, man, if you look at the historical data of how many casualties they had in other large-scale combat operations, it is nuts. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I've never actually read these numbers before, and I find them to be pretty shocking. Uh, Operation Overlord was 85 days. The casualties, KIA and wounded in action, were 209,000. And the average per day was 2,459 people a day. A day. Holy crap. Uh, Battle of Okinawa was about the same duration, 82 days, about 50,000 casualties, 609 per day. And then let's see, during the Battle of Peleliu, one of the really fascinating things is that the Marine Regiment that was taking Peleliu took 46% casualties. And then on the Battle of Iwo Jima, another fascinating thing is the fact that in the first eight hours of fighting, they medevaced six casualties per minute. Per minute. So, with that being said, I think it's uh, a very fascinating concept and one that we're all trying to grapple with and trying to figure out. The bottom line is that if, if we don't at least start thinking about these advanced challenges, if we don't start thinking about, man, what could large scale combat operations actually look like and actually be for us, well, then of course we'll be unprepared for it. Uh, I think this is the greatest reason why we're looking at prolonged casualty care and trying to make sure that it gets spread out through the Department of Defense. And I'm glad that it's getting outside of the special operations community and has essentially been distributed doctrinally to the conventional forces. But the real concern is what, how fast can we produce PCC qualified people? How quickly can we get E3s who have just come out of boot camp to be good at that stuff? And I'll tell you, we still haven't figured it out. And we're working on it, which is great. But we're still working on it. And I'll, I'll tell you, I think that this is something that, you know, doesn't have to keep you up at night. I'm sure it can. It's something that we need to conceptually grapple with in order to better lead and educate our troops. And the reason I say that is because if you look at 2,459 people a day, one, that there were a lot of people involved in this operation. We all get that. But that many people or a 46% casualty rate, the thought that immediately comes to mind is that a lot of guys are going to be grappling with some deep and hard stuff real quick. And the first wave is what figures out all the hard sticking points of combat very quickly. So what I would really just like to encourage all of you with is that the war fighting spirit that we maintain in operational forces still has to be a priority. We have to make culture violent and aggressive. We have to remind people of the values that they're fighting for and the reason that they joined. And if the reason that they joined was not to go to war, that's okay, but we need to be real about where they're going. And I would also say that if you joined operational forces, specifically combat arms, without wanting to go to war, man, your recruiter definitely got you, bro. So yeah, th this is what I'm doing with my, uh, with my Sunday afternoon. Uh, is reading through these reports and trying to make sense of a complicated picture so that I can make sure that my perspective is one that is supportive of my battalion, division, my unit. Um, that way we can do the right thing for our people. So, hey, have a good one.